ahead and get started. Um, we are on our fourth evening in our series, and tonight uh, we have Adam Sheridan with us and we're talking about work and wages and social justice and a little bit about technology. So. Okay, so I was billed today to talk about um, technology along with social doctrine and I I'm not really going to talk about technology unless you want to um, and there's time at the end um, I'm going to focus mostly on social doctrine specifically uh, the idea of social justice um, hence the title Catholicism in the social justice tradition um, so the first slide oh yeah um, my name is Adam Sheridan. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Dayton. Um, my dissertation is actually on the theology of work in the social encyclicals. Um, that would be Rerum Novarum, Quadragesimo Anno, Mater Magistra, Populorum Progressio, and John Paul II's Laborum Exercens, um, which there's a bunch of nerdy academic stuff involved with that that I want to afflict you with. Who's your advisor? My advisor is Vincent Miller. Yes. Um, I also, I guess, it's not, it's somewhat not incidental to this. Um, I actually was raised outside of Detroit, but I've spent most of my life in Dayton, and a lot of my theological concerns are really geared towards what has happened in Detroit and Dayton and how we understand work and really what has happened to work in really my generation. Um, and prior to being at going to the University of Dayton to study theology, I worked for about a decade for Borders. This was before Borders went belly up. There's lots of reasons why borders went belly up that are not unrelated to this. Um, not associated with you. Huh? Not associated with you. It was with me leaving. <laughs> the whole thing just went really bad. I mean, you know, not to get too far ahead of myself, but one of the things that really hurt borders as a company, um, which I thought was the sort of beginning of the end, is when they went from a privately owned company to publicly held because the profit demand started to squeeze on the company and then you start to do funny things, especially with labor costs and stuff like that. And yeah, you know. but borders yeah, Borders Books. I was a inventory trainer. I went around and trained other stores on how to do their inventory system. So really, it's, it's really exciting stuff. <laughs> like really, really great. That's exciting theology. <laughs> Only slightly less so, but enough to get me out of that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start out with a quote from Glenn Beck. Um, this was from March 2nd, 2010 on his radio show. It caused quite a bit of controversy at the time. He said, uh, I beg you, look for the word social justice or economic justice on your church website. If you find it, run as fast as you can. Social justice and economic justice, they are code words. Now, am I advising people to leave their church? Yes. That's why I don't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> well. Is, is he still alive? Yes. Yeah, well, you know. God bless him. OK. Um, now, this is actually from the Vatican website. This is the catechism. So, society ensures just social justice when it provides the conditions that allow associations or individuals to obtain what is their due according to their nature and their vocation. Social justice is linked to the common good and the exercise of authority. Um, just in case you're wondering, that's Part 3, Section 1, Paragraph 2, Article 3 of the Catechism. So, uh-oh, we're in deep trouble with Glenn Beck. Now, this is usually where 
a talking head, an annoying talking head starts to rail against Glenn Beck and everything that's wrong with him. And I'm not going to do that. Um, I don't really care about that. I actually think that the, the bigger issue is gazing inward at ourselves as a church that is one and how, first of all, um, we don't do a good enough job of explaining what our tradition means when it talks about social justice. And second of all, which is the much more complicated issue, um, what are we supposed to do about it once we have a generally clear idea of the principles? Um, so what is social justice? Social justice means conditions where human persons and communities obtain their due. This doesn't simply refer to merit, um, though it does include that. It means what we are due and what we owe our fellow human beings that are created in the image of God out of the gifts of creation. Um, the second is respect for human persons created in the image of God and regarding them as neighbors. Um, that's a big principle has to do with what I'll talk about in a second with solidarity. Um, <clears throat> the third is the equal dignity of all persons. This does not mean the equal distribution of talents or the equal distribution of goods. It means that according to social justice, we are all due dignity, and this is material and spiritual. Um, four, there are legitimate differences amongst persons based on their gifts and abilities. People have different talents. Different talents, however, do not merit special or greater dignity as a human person. Um, the fifth, this is a tough one, the elimination of sinful inequality. Um, as a general rule, I would say that sinful inequalities are social inequalities that diminish the dignity of the human person. It's not all inequality and in making the sort of discernment between legitimate differences based on God's gift to us as human persons versus those that diminish the dignity of the human person require some discernment. And six, the virtue of solidarity. And I'm going to talk about this more. Um, we're going to move on to some framing concepts. First one is charity and justice. Um, the relationship between charity and justice is both simple and complex. First of all, charity is a virtue. Um, in Latin, it is from char it is caritas, and it's rooted in the Greek term agape. This is love that gives without expectation of return, and that is the virtue of charity. Um, and the distinction is sort of tough to make. The charity just doesn't simply refer to the fact or refer to the instances of myself as an individual doing charitable things towards other people. The relationship of charity and justice, at least according to the tradition, are intertwined. So um, there isn't a hard and fast distinction between charity and justice. So Aristotle, for example, the Greek philosopher, he talks about friendship is perfect where justice is incomplete because fr friendship does naturally what justice demands. Um, so they're not entirely unrelated to each other. So the best way that I would explain it is that true justice from a Christian perspective is vivified by the virtue of charity. And that means that true justice is brought to life, inspired, and bound together with the virtue of charity and the idea of loving our neighbors. However, this is, first is a quote from St. John Chrysostom. Um, it's also in the catechism's discussion on care for the poor. Um, not to enable the poor to share in our goods is to steal from them 
and deprive them of life. The goods we possess are not ours, but theirs. The demands of justice must be satisfied first of all. That which is already due in justice is not to be offered as a gift of charity. It's a pretty tough thing to say, actually. Um, the next one is uh, just from the Catechism. This is a more crystallized version of that. When we attend to the needs of those in want, we give them what is theirs, not ours. More than performing works of mercy, we are paying a debt of justice. So the relationship between justice and charity here is that charitable acts are also acts of justice. And they are not some, I don't know, exceptional thing, but they're meeting minimum demands of human dignity. All right, the next concept we'll deal with is solidarity. Um, there are four aspects of solidarity that are important. The first one is that solidarity is f friendship plus social charity or love of neighbor on a social level. And this is oriented towards human and Christian brotherhood. Um, solidarity is at its root an idea of social cohesion and unity grounded in a genuine love of the neighbor. Um, second, Solidarity manifests as distribution of goods and just wage. Um, I'll talk more about what that means in a minute. Um, third, solidarity affects all levels of society. Poor to poor, rich to poor, poor to rich, worker to worker, worker to owner, etc., etc. It is a vision of how the social order should operate on all levels. Okay, and then fourth, solidarity is not just material solidarity, it's also spiritual solidarity. The love of neighbors shared on all levels of society. Okay, so those are the concepts that we'll be working with, charity and justice and solidarity. I've been afflicted with history for many years at the University of Dayton. And so social justice, it, it, because people apply it in a lot of different ways to a lot of different things. But the, in Catholic social teaching, the origin of social justice is the social question. The social question arose out of the transition from feudal medieval old social order, sometimes called the Ancien Regime, if you want to get French about it, to this new social order that happened with economic modernization. And the economic modernization has two fundamental aspects to it and then one that blew up because of it. The first one is industrialization. It fundamentally changed the nature of human work and We've kind of never quite come to a good equilibrium with that. The second one is liberal economics, which we usually refer to as capitalism, although capitalism was originally a negative term placed on liberal economics. So I don't always use the term capitalist because it has a negative connotation to it. Um, and the third one is in response to econo uh, industrialization and liberal economics comes, you know, socialism, communism, and Marxism. Because in this new social order, the dominant paradigm wasn't the relationship of the nobles to the peasants and the clergy. The dominant paradigm is those who own the businesses and those who worked for the people who own the businesses. Now, the church didn't, because this happened so rapidly, the church did not have an ability to organically evaluate and adapt to these social changes. It didn't just sort of happen in like the organic life of the church. It just happened rapidly. And the church is, has all of these old structures that were very well suited to the feudal system, but they weren't suited to these rapid changes. There were gaps. There were places that the church didn't land, like the factory floor. 
the factory floor is not something that the church anticipated and the way that it changed work. So the agrarian societies, the seasons matter, right? The calendar was wrapped around the way that the seasons move. You have daylight, you have nighttime, you have, you know, beasts of burden who do perform certain functions and they have a limited amount of energy that they can use and all of these things. Then comes the industrial factory floor. The machines never stop, right? People can be working at them all the time and this is a totally different way of understanding time and work and all of these things and the church just wasn't ready right off the bat to deal with this because the structures weren't adapted to them. So you get the social question. All of these things are going on economically, changing the shape of society in general, and then this is a question that the church has to find a way to deal with them. And so we get to social Catholicism as a response to the social question. And there are two parts to this. Most of the time people focus on the social teaching of, you know, like Leo, Pope Leo XIII with Rerum Novarum, he wrote the first social encyclical in 1891. Its principles are still permeate all of Catholic social teaching. Um, it was it, the Magna Carta of Catholic social teaching. Um, but there's also social action that actually was happening prior to Rerum Novarum and also inspired by Rerum Novarum. So there was Catholic labor movements and organizations, um, lots of them in Europe, but there also was the Knights of Labor in the United States and things like that, and the questions over um, Catholic participation in unions, which ultimately Rerum Novarum affirmed. So social Catholicism is a, the way that it's used in nerdy academic terms is fairly limited to economic questions and not just to society as such. Okay, so then we get to Rerum Novarum. These are the basics. This is the first sort of official Catholic social teaching um, in the modern era. The first basic of it, it's critical of both liberal economics and socialism slash communism. Um, the argument that Leo XIII made, makes is that the greed of liberal economics, i.e. capitalism, um, inspired socialism. You have greedy owners who don't care for their workers, the workers feel and are poor and oppressed, and then Karl Marx comes in and says, hey, we're going to fix all your problems for you, socialism. And so Leo's telling us a very particular order to that, that the problem actually starts with the way that liberal economics doesn't act in a moral way. And argues that if capitalism would act in a moral way, then socialism wouldn't ever get a fair hearing or wouldn't get any hearing with the um, working class. The second principle is the affirmation of private property. Private property is a God-given right. I'll talk about that more a little bit more in the second. Third part is distributive justice, the just distribu distribution of goods. Um, as I have some quotes from Leo the Thirteenth on that in a second. This doesn't originate with Leo the Thirteenth. It actually originates way, way back with Saint Thomas Aquinas and the idea of the just distribution of goods. Fourth, moral responsibility of both workers and owners, and harmony between them. Fifth is just wage. Owners owe to workers a just wage, and wages are not determined exclusively by either market fluctuations or the demand for profit. They are respons the responsibility of the owner towards the worker and the dignity of the worker is paramount over these two factors. Number six, pro-union. Um, workers have the right to unionize and organize themselves into associations. Um, now, Rerum Novarum and Catholic social teaching are very sp specific about this. Unions are not intended to be political organizations 
or violent revolutions. They serve a function of um, mediating between, being the voice of the workers relative to ownership. Okay, so these are the original principles of Catholic social teaching and they've remained consistent within the tra tradition for the last, I don't know, 123, 25 years. Okay, any questions about that? What does that run, run, I don't know, what's that la, what does that mean? Oh, that's great. Thank you for asking. Rem Navarro means new things, but in actually in sort of the like Latin colloquial phrasing, it means revolution. Yeah. So the the encyclical is of new things and it's of revolutions and the revolutions that um, Leo the Thirteenth is talking about is first of all like the Industrial Revolution, and then the communist response to the Industrial Revolution. Okay. I would, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Uh, you talk about uh, the problem with with uh, the liberal economics drove socialism into existence. Basically, is what you're saying. Yes. What, what did you say, ever say? What seemed to be wrong with socialism? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, there, there's a few different levels that Leo the Thirteenth and in principle that well, actually, there's I would say three that are really important. First of all, Marxist communism is based on atheistic philosophy that is not just happens to be atheistic; it's all encompassing. The term is material dialectics, but you know, that's sort of a academic jargon. But it's it, it's fundamentally atheist, and this is this is an issue that is sort of a non-starter in many ways with Marxist philosophy. The second one is um, government control over goods and the distribution of them in an absolute way, and the. To, and this violates private property, so this is the second reason. Um, and the third reason is that it has to do with the state intervention in um, the different levels of society. So there's another principle that I took out, and I should have kept it in here, um, in Catholic social teaching called subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is the idea that um, different levels of society are most competent to deal with certain issues in society and they have an integrity. So the foundation of the social order is the family. And then as issues get more extreme or in different ways than other organizations beyond the family, in this case say like unions and in sort of the most extreme situations the state, have competence to sort of intervene in certain areas. The problem with Marxism is the idea that the state is supreme over all other f forms of all other social bodies so that it can, you know, that the state trumps the family which like Catholic social teaching would never accept that the family is the first society and has its own integrity unto itself. So those are sort of the... So would that be like the one-child rule in China? <laughs> yeah, well, that's very funny because, well, yeah, I mean, we, can, we can talk about I, I just mean, China, that, I mean, because they're socialists. Sure. Country, so that would be the state trumping the family. Yeah, I mean, there's evidence of that's that. Yeah, yes, yes. Why we seem to not care as much about Maoist communism as we did about Leninist communism is a whole other conversation probably because they make more stuff for us than the Soviets did. But. I have another question. Um, what's happened since Leo XIII wrote Rerorum Novarum? Rerum Novarum. Yeah, yeah, right. And if they consider this the foundation of Catholic social teachings, look at the unions. Mm -hmm. Today in, all, in the United States, unions are political. A lot of things have changed. How can we go by that that was developed in 1891 currently? Well, collective bargaining is a 
fundamental principle of unions, the idea that the worker, the unions as the voice of the workers can collectively bargain with ownership over wages and benefits and things like that. Which is not necessarily political until collective bargaining is. Is, but is, unions it, is also it possible that the unions are for the union leaders maybe sometimes more than the workers? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I would say yes, and I would say that I, I am not, I, I am talking about in principle, I am not talking about the, the you know, the, the unions, the problems that the unions in the United States have sort of had, you know, and legitimate critiques of the unions. But also, I would say that the legitimate critiques of the power of unions in the United States has turned into a rejection of unions as such, and I would disagree with that on principle, that the rejection of unions as such is more problematic relative to the church's teaching than it is to say this union has become a self-interested entity that isn't a mediating, that doesn't mediate between the workers and the ownership. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the common good and the relationship of private property and the universal destination of goods. Um, so these are two different quotes from Ram Navaram um, that deal with this. The first one is the affirmation of private property. The fact that God has given the earth for the use and enjoyment of the whole human race can in no way be a bar to the owning of private property. For God has granted the earth to mankind in general, not in the sense that all without distinction can deal with it as they like, but rather that no part of it was assigned to anyone in particular, and that the limits of private possession have been left to be fixed by man's own industry and by the laws of individual races. Okay. And, hmm? You, well, encyclicals can be a bit vague. Um, the second one is that it would be irrational to neglect one portion of the citizens and favor another, and therefore the public administration must duly and solicity, solicitously provide for the welfare and the comfort of the working classes. Otherwise, that law of justice would be violated, which ordains that each man, sorry, ladies, it's Latin, that um, shall have his due among the many and grave duties of rulers who would do their best for the people. The first in chief is to act with strict justice, with that justice which is called distributive towards each and every class alike. Okay, so um, private property, yes, and the general overall universal destination of goods. So where does private property come from? How do we talk about it? Um, begins with the Bible, um, Genesis 1.28, actually Genesis 1.26 through 1.28 are a broader understanding of it but Genesis 1 28 um, God blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground um, the term that we use for this and actually later on when you talk about environmental issues it might come up is human is human dominion over creation Humanity, according to scripture, was, or at least the tradition's interpretation of scripture, was that humanity is to rule and preside over creation. The earth is for humanity to possess and to subdue, otherwise act upon and transform. Um, although, of course, the ultimate rule and dominion belongs to God. Okay, 
what the catechism says in a neater way is the appropriation of property is legitimate for guaranteeing the freedom and dignity of persons and for helping each of them meet his basic needs and the needs of those in his charge. Private property is a positive good. It guarantees freedom. This is over and against totalitarian or statist control over private property and distribution. Um, it also affords us dignity. Um, we are dignified through private property, the use and stewardship of creation. Okay, the next one is the universal destination of goods. This is from Acts, oh, sorry, Acts 4, 32 through 35. Um, the community of believers was of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they had everything in common. With great power of the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great favor was accorded them all. There is no needy person among them, for those who owned property or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sale, and put them at the feet of the apostles, and they were distributed to each according to need. That sounds a little communist to me. No, I'm just kidding. Huh? Or at least socialist. <laughs> well, what's the difference? It's an important difference. It's really important difference. What's the... In you know, there is the, the Marxist statement from each according to their works to each according to their needs. <laughs> the difference is this is given with love. Yes, and then it's They're given with volunteers. freely, right? It's the free expression of love from the faithful. Okay. Um, this is how private, pro this is how the catechism understands private property in the unit universal destination. The right to private property acquired or received in a just way does not do away with the original gift of the earth to the whole of mankind. The universal destination of goods remains primordial even if the promotion of the common good requires respect for the right to private property and its exercise. Okay, all of creation is universally destination destined for all of humanity. It's primordial. It is the end towards which our private property attains. Now, this is all somewhat ambiguous and odd. So what this looks like, George Bailey. Every, I, I, I will preface this by saying that I teach a religion in film class, and my students, first of all, none of them had ever seen It's a Wonderful Life, which, which made me really, really sad. sad. Yeah. But this is, this is like, this is, was my moment of hope and grace, because they all loved it. They, they thought, they were like, this is such a great message, and I was like, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Uh, Yes, exactly. Um, and really, it was, out of the, uh, it was out of our class discussion about this that I sort of came upon this realization because they really were quite attuned to sort of the economic aspects of the story um, because, as we'll talk about later, millennials, as they're referred to, have a high anxiety about the world that they're about to enter into. Um, Okay, so first of all, does, can, does everybody remember the bank run scene in It's a Wonderful Life? It's like a classic scene. Okay, so everything I need to know about the universal destination of goods I learned from George Bailey. So you have George Bailey versus Henry Potter, the evil Scroogey guy. Um, and does anybody remember what he offers these people when they're 50 cents on the dollar, right? It's like sort of like the immediate, like, give me my money. Um, and Henry Potter 
has a sense of, Avi has a very clear sense of the right to private property without any sense of the common good that it's supposed to attain towards. George Bailey throughout the movie, this is like the, one of the main themes, which, well, is a priority on the community and the health and life of the community, love of neighbor, and that private property exists for the common good. Now, there's actually a background reason to this. Um, does anybody know about Frank Capra's life? Well, he was an uh, immigrant from Sicily, um, and his family grew up very poor, and this caused him to sort of reject his Catholic faith in pursuit of wealth. And he had this sort of realization that all of this pursuit of wealth was worthless and meaningless and caused him more harm and he returns to the church you know and um his and and critics or commentators on frank capra say that um towards this happens towards the middle of his career and you can tell in his movies that he starts to make films that are very concerned with questions of like social justice and these themes you can actually see in his films which is pretty awesome Okay, so lessons from George Bailey. There, there are two really big lessons that the bank run scene sort of gives you. First of all, it, he gives this brilliantly eloquent e explanation of the universal destinations of, good, of goods. So everybody is standing there and they're like, where is my money? And he says, I don't have your money, right? It's not because it's hidden in an offshore account. Right. <laughs> it's because this money is working for other people, right? So he's like, the, I don't have your money because your money is in this person's house so that they can have private property, right? They can own a home and live in a dignified kind of way. Um, one person's money, and then that person pays the money back. That money goes back into the community, maybe to help somebody start a business. And this is how private property and the universal destination of goods can work in a, you know, in a very, I wouldn't necessarily say ideal sense, but in a, an example of what it would look like. Okay, um, the other lesson that I think is really important is that when push comes to shove, right, when he takes his, like, honeymoon money and passes it out, what happens? Do you remember? People took what they needed, not what they yes. wanted. The first one, the first dude was like, give me all my money. And he's like, all right. And then the rest of them all took what they needed, not what they owned, what they needed. So one person takes $20 to get through the next week. This is obviously a different economic time. Um, and so on and so forth. But this is all centered around the idea of the community and the common good and the notion of the common good and the health of the community. So this is, you know, when you watch It's a Wonderful Life, there's this great sort of lesson about Catholic social teaching in it. Okay, so now we get to the social doctrine of the church. I'm pointing this out because everything that I've been talking about from the catechism, this isn't like... And I, I, this is in no way disparaging anything that Catherine said. I love Catherine. She's one of my best friends. Um, there's a lot of theories about just war, right? Social doctrine and the principles that I've laid out from the catechism are doctrine. So the catechism says that the church's social teaching comprises a body of doctrine which is articulated as the church interprets events in the course of history with the assistance of the Holy Spirit in the light of the whole of what has been revealed by Jesus Christ. Now, as doctrine, it's official teaching. On some level, it's a, well, it is authoritative. And in some senses, or in many senses, it's binding. Um, now, this, this is important. It doesn't in disclude good faith disagreement with social doctrine um, or how you enact it or things like that, sometimes the ambiguity is a good thing, right? Because 
it's not an ideology and it's not a specific set of policy. It is a teaching on how we should, how, what our attitudes and our perspectives should be on these sorts of issues, but it is authoritative. Okay, so this is why the church cares about it. The church makes a moral judgment about economic and social matters when the fundamental rights of the person or the salvation of souls requires it. In the moral order, she bears a mission distinct from that of political authorities. The church is concerned with the temporal aspects of the common good because they are ordered to the sovereign good, our ultimate end. She strives to inspire right attitudes with respect to earthly goods and in socioeconomic relationships. And this is important because social doctrine is not ideology. It's not, even though the term often gets used, the church's position is not an ideological third way between liberal economics and communism. It's often described as a third way, but that's not quite correct because it's not a program or a economic philosophy in that sense. It's not particularly a, a doctrine or I mean a policy. Um, it's supposed to inspire us, give us the framework to strive for social justice. Okay, now we get to talk about something even more fun than unions. Just wage. Okay, uh, just wage. What does the church teach about wages? First of all, just wage is the legitimate fruit of work. To withhold just wages is a, can be a grave injustice. And, you know, catechetically, grave is an important term here because withholding just wage is, has the moral gravity of, can have moral gravity of mortal sin. Okay, um, there are two factors when determining just wage in principle that are important. First one is sufficient need, the material needs of people, having a roof over your, your head, having enough calories, et cetera, et cetera but also the individual's contribution, what the worker has contributed to the business, what the work actually contributes to the business, which is not just sufficient need. Um, okay, and ultimately the broader idea of it is that just wage guarantees a dignified livelihood for working persons. It's not just a roof over one's head or you know, enough food in one's belly, but to live their life in a dignified way. And that is, these are the principles of just wage. Yes? Did, would you say, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Jason talked about um, the seamless garment of life. Yes. So when we're talking about the need for a just wage guaranteeing a dignified livelihood, would that, he talks a lot, he talked a lot about the, the flourishing of all humankind. Yes. So a, a livelihood that allows people Yes, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, this is very old. There's this person named um, John Ryan, a Catholic, who actually calculated what a just wage would be. This was a long time ago, but it really was brilliant. I mean, right down to how much money you would have to make, a, a person would have to make to be able to afford a suit to go to mass, right? I mean, these, it's not, and, it, and it's not just like, well, how are you gonna have shoes on your feet? It's how can you walk into mass or down the street and feel dignified? And like, these are all, you know, it's a very complicated thing to calculate, right? I'm not, it's a very difficult thing. But yes, the idea of flourishing um, and that as a human person, you feel that you're, not equal, but that you can be afforded a certain way, a, a certain level of dignity in your life, which is, you know. So it would have to include for things like education. Yeah. Okay. So the current minimum wage. Oh yeah. yeah. Not consider a just wage. <laughs> yes. Well, this is the budget. That this is. I don't know if there's anybody read about this. 
Okay, yeah, McDonald's put out a budget. This, this is McDonald's own budget because what they were trying to do was help their minimum wage employees be able to like, live better off of minimum wage. Unfortunately, what their budget proved is that you cannot actually live off of a minimum wage. And this is a two-income family, and I'm sure if you guys go through the line items here, you're going to be like, dude, this is not... This is not realistic. Now, yeah, right. The, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't. I mean, honestly, if you go by just what the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau and all the statistics for um, what they consider poverty level, you would see that, you know, the yes. minimum wage, you can, it, it doesn't get you up to poverty level. Yes. You have to be below that. Yes. I mean, and there's two, uh, there's two, I, okay, there's two sort of issues involved here that I think are legitimate questions about, um, that I just don't want this to be a caricature. The first one is, is that people will argue that these, working at McDonald's was never meant to be the kind of job that people have for their whole life, which I totally agree with. I will also say from personal, this is personal experience from working in management at retail in Dayton, when the plant closed, I had people coming in who were making, you know, much more money and with benefits and all of those things asking for a job. And I'm like, dude, you can get $7 an hour with no benefits, right? And this is sort of the nature of how, how that shift has happened. We talked about it too just recently. Is that you know, I don't know what it was. Um, about you no, know, the jobs aren't meant to be to be the, for the next twenty years or thirty years working. But on the same hand, you also have people who don't have the skills or the education to get better jobs. Well, you know, or the that, ability to get or the ability to, to do whatever it takes to get a better job because maybe they're not mentally physically capable. Well, in actuality, I, I agree with that. But this is, this is the reality of kids these days. 53.6% of people under the age of 25 with bachelor's degrees were, are currently underemployed or jobless. Half of this number work minimum wage scale jobs. Waiters, cashiers, retail clerks. So these are not incapable people. These are very capable people. Um, only three of 30 jobs with projected growth by 2020 will require a bachelor's degree, teacher, professor, I really hope. Um, and yeah, I don't know what growth means, right? <laughs> um, and you know, I'm not, this is not just, a, I'm not saying this in an alarmist way, but it, it, a lot of analysts think this, that the next bubble that's gonna burst is going to be the student loan bubble because students making College graduates making minimum wage, barely scraping by, or not even, or living with their parents, um, doing all of those things and not making enough money to pay back their student loans, and the interest is running on that, and you know we all know how bubbles burst in this country, unfortunately. Um, now there's another tier to that, which gets to what you were talking about, that you have you know, the person with the bachelor's degree, the people with the bachelor's degrees getting jobs at like Starbucks, which is squeezing out the unskilled workers, right? So the people who would have had those jobs who with high school diplomas aren't gonna have them now because they're getting squeezed out from the top. And this is like a real, it, it's a, it's yes. And the other, and on the other end, then you also have yeah. people who can't afford to retire yeah. yes. who are hanging on to jobs mm -hmm. so yes. longer than they normally would. So, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Anna? Yes. You said just a minute ago that we all know what will happen when the bubble bursts. What no, I'm just saying we all have it. What all, did you mean? I said we all know what happens when a bubble bursts. What happens? <laughs> Well, 2008 is what happened, right? This is, yeah. 
So yeah, I mean the, the market crashed. Yeah, I mean in, in 2008, I am just like a, the 2008 from our like, um, it, it's it's very interesting because when well when I first started at teaching at UD, you probably 9/11 was sort of the like thing in the students' head all the time. 2008 is what is in students' heads all the time now. They have a deep anxiety about it's this. our heads, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, because when they move back home, it's going to be in. Well, no. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they're getting close to retirement. Yes. We don't, you know, where is that retirement coming from? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's... Uh, and, I, and I'm only pointing to one aspect of this very large and complicated issue that I am not competent to discuss, much less diagnose, um, but that the wages themselves are becoming a serious issue. One of the interesting experiences that I had um, was during the last papal election, it was actually while I was teaching, it was, it was you know, everyone is waiting <clears throat> And the white smoke appears right when I have to go teach. And I was like, right. It's not really something you can TiVo either. Um, <laughs> so I walk into my classroom. I'm sitting there in my classroom. And my students, you know, because they're, this, is, this is sort of the MO of students now. Their heads are all like this, which if you want to invent something that's going to actually, like, First of all, make you a lot of money, and second of all, make the world a better place. Find a way so that they can have like a picture window and a camera that's pointing outward, so when they're walking, they don't run into everything. It would, it would actually, yes, exactly. So then, anyways, and and they were all talking about the papal election and things like that, and. Which was very surprising with my students because I generally think that I'm very cynical and think that my students are totally detached from their faith and that, you know, that's all just wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> which, which next Monday will like, not help my opinions on that very much at all. Um, but, they, uh, but they were all genuinely, like, interested. They were genuinely, they were talking about it and I didn't have to sort of you know, prompt them to do so. And um, and so then they were all like, hey, can we watch and see who the next pope's going to be? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I brought it up on the big screen, and, like, you know, they were all like, um, you know, and Francis steps out, and, you know, and then there's a little bit of information, and I actually, we you know, we, they wanted to watch TV all day, but I turned it off. <laughs> and that was, you know, but then we could, that was like, okay, well, look up, Francis of Assisi do all of these things, and they got a pretty good picture, I think, of what <clears throat> Pope Francis is all about. The reason why I'm saying this is that um, Pope Francis, first of all, he's genuine. Second of all, he is, in marketing terms, is incredibly well branded for the internet. He is the one of the most brilliant papacies. Because, you know, I remember, and, and substantively, I don't think, I, 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 it annoys, really annoys the crap out of me when people make these differences between Benedict XVI and Francis when it comes to, like, doctrine and things like that. But, you know, Pope Benedict comes and he's wearing his red shoes, right? And you have to actually explain to people that this is not just, like, some dude wearing fancy red shoes, right? But with Francis, it's just, you know, the image that everybody knows is him washing the feet of the, you know, youth prisoners. And these are like Instagram messages, right? These are like flashes across the internet. And it's, it really is in terms of technology. And I know that it sounds sort of funny, but um, Francis has found a way to leaven the internet in a way that Pope Benedict didn't, and I think that it's good that he, the, the church is actually present on the internet in a way that I'm absolutely surprised about. Um, so, 
I'm not all doom and gloom about technology, although, <clears throat> you know, I'm not all celebrating it either. <laughs> OK. Um, so just wage is, isn't simply a matter of policy. It's a matter of social justice. And, uh, but it's also a complicated issue. I mean, and I know that it's kind of lame to say that I don't have any good answers, but I don't. OK, so these are some points to consider, some things to ask ourselves. Can we jettison social justice? Um, more importantly, how can we better articulate the principles of social justice, not just in our words, but in our actions? I think the third part is really important. We live in a world that is seems to be divided along ideological lines all the time. And anything that happens, there's something on this side and something on this side that is going to polarize it. And I think that one of the issues is how can we have good faith and goodwill disagreements over what social justice look like, looks like and how it's enacted while still maintaining unity. Um, so the question that I, in the vice presidential election, I wanted to ask of Paul Ryan and Joseph Biden is, how do you, how do you understand yourselves as one every Sunday? Because I think that's an important thing. OK, um, next is, how are we agents of social justice? Um, where can we be most effective when you ask questions about consumer practices, and how does the church's teachings challenge us? Um, in terms of where we can be most effective, I, I think that it, would, it might be good to look at the difference between Costco and Walmart, maybe. Costco is a very interesting business model. Um, they, during the recession, they raised, they raised their employees' wages. Um, they, there's a there's a scale limit to how much the CEO can make versus like the person working in the stores, and I think it's 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 a, it's a fairly like you know structured scale. Um, I think that during the recession, this all of the like C upper management people just decided to. Um, they decided to not take any of their bonuses and redistribute it amongst the employees. And these are like, you know, and I'm not saying that Costco is a perfect co company. Um, there's companies like Trader Joe's as well that are incredibly good to their employees. So good that if I fail as a theologian, I'm going to get a job working at Trader <laughs> Joe's. Um, and so when it talks about, how, you know, when it comes to questions about like what can we do, Yes, I think like elections and things like that matter, but it's actually making questions of social justice part of our consumer equation, right? That it's not just where can I find the cheapest possible goods, but what kind of character does the company have and factor that into the factor that into your purchasing equation um, and support the companies that I think try to act in a way that's amenable to social justice. So, I think a tough balance for me too is balancing between buying almost exclusively local um, from, you know, I know that family, but then also supporting large corporations that have good moral practices because they employ a lot of people. So I think for me sometimes that balance can be really difficult to, to necessarily know where to put my money. Yeah, I mean, I. You know, I would say that it's almost impossible to be unimplicated in the worst parts of the economy. I mean, I am wearing clothes made in sweat sh sweatshops right now, and I'm fully aware of that, right? Um, doesn't mean I'm complicit, but I'm definitely implicated in it. Um, I think that the model of subsidiarity is pretty good when it comes to things like that, too. I really do. I think that um, the things that you can get local closer to the source it's better and it's not just better like it's better even on the most practical level like you 
the more the closer you are to knowing the person who made it, the better it is. But there are things that you that that is not realistic about, and that you know it expands the circle. So I do. I try to move in in out as much as I possibly can. But you know, yeah. Well, I'm not. You know, I'm not Amish, and I don't live near Amish, so like I can't like just dive into a fully self-sufficient community. Well, to that point, though, if, if we're thinking social justice, social justice is worldwide, and those cheap things that, or the lesser expensive things being manufactured in Malaysia, who has a whole different perspective on, on living, mm -hmm. uh, might be making a living wage in that plant in Malaysia. Yes. And when you're buying it, you're supporting them. You can argue that social justice too. It doesn't help the folks locally, but yeah. And actually, what's really interesting about that is that the the um, it, it's a it's it's actually starting to happen more. Um, but that the church itself is a sort of untapped resource in that way, right? Because the church is a transnational body, so. The you know the the Jesuits working with the poor in one country can actually communicate rather directly with the Jesuits working you know the Jesuits someplace else and so on and so forth in ways that's it's not like through bol political channels or things like that um, and there's actually there are like things like that happening with um, some of the real real slave labor that's happening in Brazil currently and things like that so yeah i mean i i think that there's a there's a way that the church and i don't mean just as some sort of like you know spectral like institution entity but like you know us can be part of a church that does that in a transnational sort of you know. well as you have seen now in the fourth week these are not easy questions you know it's not black and white there's a lot of intermingling and it's all very intertwined. And, you know, that's why it's important to know what the church teaches. You know, what is it that we are teaching and what we're supposed to know as Catholics? And I think Adam did a great job presenting yes. that. And I, and I would like to say about Goodwill disagreements, I forgot to say this, is that there's a rabbinic saying that I think is really important, that there's a difference between argument for the sake of winning and argument for the sake of God. And uh, I think a lot of times we <clears throat> get into the situation of arguing for the sake of winning and uh, not arguing for the sake of God. Absolutely. And all God. Nothing is sacred except the sight. From the very beginning, all knowledge is